And next, um, let's, I'll move the slide forward, is Dr. Nancy Lever. Um, and Dr. Nancy Lever is the co-director of University of Maryland's School of Medicine, Center for School Mental Health. She's also Safe Schools Healthy Students Technical Assistance Provider, so we've been working together for a few years now. Um, Nan Dr. Lever has also uh, co-editor of the Handbook of School Mental Health, so if you're interested in a uh, comprehensive school mental health model, you want to see Dr. Lever, she's here all, t all day today. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, everyone. All hard acts to follow, but I'm going to do my best. Um, so again, as Mary said, I'm Nancy Lever, and I've been fortunate to be able to work with our National Resource Center for Youth Mental Health Promotion and Violence Prevention. We have our website here, and if anyone is tweeting, we you know, at Healthy Safe Kids, please, it would make Kelly and our um, National Resource Center team so happy to have <laughs> anyone, anyone a big tweeter? No? Okay. Always the younger person. Yeah. You know, we've been hearing a lot about how we have to take care of our youth, and I don't want to take any of that away, but we, one of the things I've, over my career that I've thought a lot about is how do we take care of the people who are taking care of everyone? Now, how many people in this room are in mental health? How many people would say you're in education? Yeah. And, or that combination, you don't even know which hat you're wearing. Um, but when you think about that, often those are professions where we have a tremendous amount of responsibility for taking care of other people. And one of the things we know about people who take care of other people, let's, let's see if you guys know the answer to this. Are they good at taking care of themselves? No, no they are so good at taking care of everybody else. And then, you know, as I always say, something's got to give, like you can do a great job, everything can look great, you should see my house. It's a mess, you know. <laughs> There's always somewhere where you kind of lose some of that, but it can't be an afterthought. It can't be something we do, uh-oh, that way, ha-ha. <laughs> it can't be something we do, you know, like, oh, let's throw this in and let's try and do some wellness. If we're gonna do wellness, we really need to think about, you know, what can we do for our staff? So one thing in doing talks about wellness, if you think I embody all wellness, no. I certainly don't. I think just like everyone else, it's something that I absolutely strive for and you know, have to work towards every day. Like that pumpkin bread, did everyone have that, that pumpkin <laughs> bread? It's like, are you kidding me? That, that is worth not following wellness. <laughs> you have to make important decisions in life. And I actually gave a keynote um, for a national conference in South Carolina earlier in the year on staff wellness, and that's another way that you can do this. If you want to motivate and try and take care of your own wellness, agree to give a keynote on wellness because you really feel like you have to follow <laughs> what you're preaching. Now think of, I bet many of you can teach wellness, but are you actually living it? Are you, you know, I'm gonna sound like Oprah here, like you can't just do this for one day or do a quick diet. You know, how do you make sure that you're integrating this into what you do? Um, as Mary mentioned, I'm with the, the Center for School Mental Health, and with that hat, we really have focused on advancing research, training, policy, and practice in school mental health. But one of the things that we've learned is it really is a shared family, school, community, mental health agenda. We've done a lot of work with NASD, the IDA partnership, and we truly believe in that model. But as part of that model, you really need to nurture the adults that are within that, the people who you are counting on to do your caregiving. So why wellness? I worked um, with a dropout prevention program in high school for 10 years. I had, I think my office was a former closet, but you know, it was like if you think about, let's start with wellness, I mean, does anyone have really glamorous offices in schools? You know, if you're going in it for glamour, you, that you should not be working in schools. And, um, I've done a lot of administrative leadership, running our clinical programs, and working with people who are trying to help students. Um, I've co-led two research studies related to staff wellness, uh, you know, mental health providers, school educators, 
And in watching this, like, this isn't just a problem in Maryland. It's not just a problem within your community. It really is a national challenge, thinking about what can we do. Um, in talking to everybody, if you think of your job, think of what role you are in, how many people used to do your job? And often people are, you know, you, you became, you know, John and Jim, and like you not only did this person leave, but you were already busy. And then you got someone else's work on top of that, and you remember working with them, and they were busy too. So, anyone have that experience that, <laughs> no, yeah. Usually, what's happened in my life is, if it's an opportunity, be scared of that word. I have a new opportunity for you, and it usually, often it comes with a new title. I have a lot of titles, but um, it doesn't necessarily, things don't get taken away. A lot of things keep, you know, are getting added to your plate. And that's just work. That doesn't include, well, what else is going on? What's going on with your children, with your parents, with your relatives, you know, illness, um, all kinds of things. Like, the day that you haven't even made it into the door of your house and you have all the stress from work, but there's real life going on at home in your community as well. So what we do know is, this is depressing, many people are unwell. For every 100 employees in the country, we have 27 with cardiovascular disease, 24 with high blood pressure, 50 or more with high cholesterol, 26 are overweight, um, by 20% or more, that's depressing. Um, 10 or more are heavy, are heavy drinkers, and 59 don't get adequate exercise. And now I'm feeling guilty. I did not go to the gym last night, but um, you know, <laughs> these are the hard decisions we need to make. Now, as a whole, let's, New Hampshire is actually doing quite well. When I um, presented in South Carolina, they were like number 43. So I'm like, oh, I have to look and see how New Hampshire is doing on this national survey. So it's an index of over 20 different metrics, smoking, physical activity, obesity, diabetes, mort infant mortality, immunizations. New Hampshire is doing great. You're fifth overall across the country. But, and I, you, I've heard this you know, from your commissioner, <coughs> <clears throat> and just thinking about like, some of the comments that people have made, while you're making improvements um, in the past two years, drug deaths increased 29%. So substance use is an area that is impacting. But your poor physical health days are decreasing, so that's good. But there's something on the horizon, like if, you know, how do we make sure that your staff are continuing to stay well? So, you know, what causes stress? And, you know, think about marriages. <laughs> think about, like, what, you know, what are people stressing about? And typically, money and work are right up our leading causes of that. And three quarters of American report work-related stress. I know none of you have stress, right? <laughs> Nothing. Like, I always wish there could be little gremlins who, while I'm doing, you know, while I'm sitting doing something one day, that they could be doing all the other work in the background. But. <laughs> It, you know, of course, it doesn't work that way. But what we do know is we can't prevent all stress, but what can we do to help reduce stress? And what we know is it's costly. When, you know, it's a major cause of disability, and it costs, you know, at the, you know, one study estimated 20 to 30 billion annually due to worker absenteeism. So why wellness in schools? I, I like to put cartoons into things. So I know the kids don't like you and pick on you, but you have to go to school. You're the teacher. <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, think of your favorite teacher when you were growing up. I don't know. I, I was a really geeky little kid. I did my work. I don't, and I've, I never really thought of the teacher leaving the school building. I don't even know what I thought happened to them. but. I didn't really think of them having lives or having stress, and I don't feel like they shared that in any way with us, but it's hard for the teacher. It's hard, you know, it's challenging with all the stressors that teachers have, and I think it's something that people don't necessarily think about. You know, you go on an airplane, and one of the first things they tell you is if the oxygen mask straps down, put your own mask on first, and then help the person next to you. You cannot take care of other people if you're not taking care of yourself. It's a really simple message, and yet often we all try to do that. How many of you typically skip lunch? 
how many of you, but if, you, if there was a child and they were skipping lunch, you'd be outraged. You know, how many of you know that you're supposed to eat breakfast? I mean, I could sit there and give you all the things you know you're supposed to do, but yet we're too busy and we're rushing to get to the next things. So what we do know for teachers is that you know, they have high rates of stress, um, vicarious trauma, and Megan talked a little bit about the trauma that our youth experience, but if you're working with youth and they're experiencing all of this and you're hearing about it, it can be traumatic for those staff as well. We know, I'll talk a little bit about rates of teacher turnover and also talk money, because money matters, and consider some of the benefits of having school wellness programs. So who says teachers, teaching is stressful? I'm 39 and I feel great. <laughs> So even if you try and cover it up, it can be, it can be really stressful being a teacher. Um, this is a quote from the president of the American Federation of Teachers, and I just think this kind of sums it up a little bit. We ask teachers to be a combination of Albert Einstein, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King Jr., and Tony Soprano. We ask them to be mom and dad and impart tough love, but also be a shoulder to lean on. And when they don't do these things, we blame them for not being saviors of the world. What is the effect? The effect has been teachers are incredibly stressed out. We are asking a lot of our teachers, and that's why it's so important that we are also supporting and providing um, things for them as well. So anyone here, you, know, you can't be in education and not have opinions about testing. And that has been a popular topic in terms of teacher stress. So in a study by the National Education Association where they uh, evaluated and asked teachers 1,500 PK to 12 <coughs> teachers about how they felt about testing, 72% felt moderate or extreme pressure from school and district administrators related to testing, 42% reported emphasis on standardized test scores had a negative impact on the classroom, and this is concerning, 45% considered quitting because of standardized testing. But you know, these are, this is our future, these are our children, you know, it's not good that so many people want to leave. So, if you need to figure out, you need to consult with someone important, you turn to Dr. Seuss, who, this was back in 98, so it kind of predates some of the, <coughs> some of the comments about testing. So all schools for miles and miles around must take a special test to see who's learning such and such, to see which school's the best. If our small school does not do well, then it will be torn down, and you will have to go to school in dreary flubber town. You know, but think about this, like they can sit there and say, don't worry. I mean, do you think the students feel that they shouldn't worry? We can say that, but they can feel the stress of everyone around them, around here's this big test and you have to do your best and you know, how do they not pick that up? My children, I have an 11 year old and a 13 year old. I think they actually like testing because what they've figured out is on testing days, they get to watch movies after the test is done. And, and often I give a better breakfast. So like, you know, these are the things that matter to them. But, um, you know, but they are impacted and they do worry about what it will mean and, you know. So what are our teachers stressed about? I don't, you know, many of you in the field, you know some of this. You know, we have, in addition to educational testing, we have large classes, um, behavioral challenges in students. It can be quite challenging for a teacher, you know, they say like one in every five students have a, a mental health challenge, may be impacted, yet if you have a classroom and there's five students who are off task and you're trying to manage that, it can be hard to teach the topic at hand if there's so many other things going on. Um, we do know that many of our classrooms are you know, under-resourced and teachers are often using some of their own funds or creatively using what they have Okay, this is, you're gonna shock, be shocked by this. Bureaucracy, I know you can't imagine there's any <laughs> bureaucracy, but you work in a system and you're crossing you know, education, often mental health, um, physical health as well, juvenile justice. There's challenges and you know, trying to um, make sure you're doing all this while being responsible for others. And I think one of the things that people talk about is there being a gap between I went into this with a good heart and this is what I thought I was going to do and now I'm in the profession and this is what I'm doing. And I'm hoping that that 
perception is hopefully training is catching up and addressing how to you know, address pro challenges in the classroom. But a lot of people talk about being surprised that it just wasn't quite what they thought it would be when they were training. How many have heard of compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma? Okay. It's the emotional residue or strain of exposure to working with those experiencing the consequences of traumatic events. It can occur due to exposure on one case or can be due to accumulated levels of trauma. Now, I think when this term first came out, everyone talked about it as being something you, our mental health cl clinicians were experiencing because they were the ones providing therapy. But what they're realizing over time is that the educators, the people who are in the classroom, are also hearing about the trauma. They may not be doing therapy, but they are having that same secondary trauma effect as our mental health providers, which can lead to burnout, where you just become very physically and emotionally tired, you know, with you know, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, a reduced sense of like, I'm doing something and I'm doing it well. Um, you know, you just are not enjoying what you've done and you're questioning, like, did I pick the right career? And there's more, you, you don't go to work quite as much. You're um, cynical, very pessimistic. And the, the recipe for this is when you have high responsibility and low control is the best recipe. You know, so thinking about as, you know, if you're in a role, what can you do for your educators, A, to be taking care of them, but if they're feeling this way, how do you help um, address some of those concerns? And it, so, it, you know, of course we don't want our, you know, teachers being burnt out, but not only does it um, impact the teacher, but it also impacts the students in that classroom. If you have that teacher who just, doesn't have that mojo going, it's, it's gonna come across in the energy, the excitement, the passion that they share in the educations. And when they're interacting with their students, there's more sarcasm, more aggression, and just really responding negatively to mistakes. So, um, see things, I bet a lot of people don't read the bottom where the citations are, but this citation was worth it. So I had to put it up, so look closely. This was a study done by the American Federation of Teachers with the group, the Badass Teachers. Like, don't you wanna be part of the Badass Teachers? I don't know who they are or what they've done, but they co-led this study with the American Federation of Teachers. So always take a moment to look at those underlying things, because you never know, it might be the Badass Teachers. Um, they did a survey of 30,000 teachers and it revealed that 89% felt, uh, first 80% of teachers reported feeling physically and emotionally exhausted at the end of the day. And 89% stated that they were enthusiastic about teaching when they started. But at the time of the survey, only 15% said they felt that way. And look at that sad face that Mary made. <laughs> but, um, you know, what do we do? And why does this matter so much? So, you know, we always hear about student dropout and how it's such a big problem. And, you know, it's, it makes the, head, the news lines and there's magazine covers about it. But where is that article about teacher dropout and that this is a crisis? We know that 10% of teachers leave after a year in the profession. 17% leave within five years. In urban districts, up to 70% of teachers leave within the first year. And more teachers leave um, education when compared to social service professionals, including mental health service providers. So over a four year time period, teacher dropout is actually greater than our student dropout. And yet, are we hearing that this is a major problem? And it's not just a problem, so then people say, well, it's just the new teachers, but, or it's just the teachers who sh probably shouldn't have been in the profession to begin with. And what they found when looking at the research on that is 80% in the top quartile of academics are leaving education within the first five years. Now granted, there are some people who never in intended to teach long term, that this was something they wanted to do for a few years and then go on to another um, profession, but there are a lot of people who were going in and intending to stay. So, you know, what can we do as a field? And that's where, you know, staff wellness and making sure that you're taking care of your staff is so critical. And this goes back to Megan's presentation 
And as we heard this morning from Kevin, like having a caring adult in a youth's life is so critically important. And if, you know, often when you ask people who is that adult, it could be a family member, but often it's that teacher. It's that favorite middle school, high school, elementary school, just the principal, someone who took the time. And that's where it's so critical. If we have teachers leaving, if we have so many people moving away from the school, you don't get that continuity. The best learning comes from when you have that continuity over time. And also, when teachers leave, it'd be nice if they all left at the end of the year, but sometimes these departures are occurring at very random points during the school year. So what do we do? How do we fix this? So let's move and talk more about wellness. Like, what is wellness? And you know, as I mentioned earlier, it really is an active process. It involves awareness and making choices to a more successful existence. And you know, the good part is the choices. Like, if there isn't a one-stop shop and every, everything fits for everyone. What you may need may be different than what someone else will need. And how you define success will be different. But it really is an opportunity to make yourself more successful, to make yourself more aware, and to figure out what, what is that fit for you. When we think of wellness, often people kind of stop at the physical and medical. You hear about all kinds of wellness programs and this can help your health or this can lower your blood pressure. But wellness also involves intellectual, spiritual, financial wellness, social, environmental, occupational, like are you challenged? Are there opportunities within your career? Um, emotional wellness. So, you know, when you're thinking of wellness and if you want to create programs or come up with strategies for your school, Think about this larger picture. Now, while it's often nice to start with the weight loss and nutrition programs, there really is a wider range of what's meant by wellness. So being a researcher, you feel like you're giving a talk and you have to go look things up and make sure you're presenting numbers. So um, I looked at our national registry on evidence-based program from SAMHSA, and there were 17 programs listed under the keyword of wellness and three focused on K-12 students, two focused on college students, and one focused on three to 12 and college students. But there wasn't a study within this that truly, you know, that truly focused on school staff. So this really is an emerging literature. There definitely are programs that are probably promising at the moment, but there's not some of this established, like if you want school wellness, this is exactly what you need to do. I also looked at wellness and teacher in PsycInfo, which is, a search mechanism that we use for looking for articles and looked at things that were published between 84 and 2015. And you can see that it's increasing. But if I were to put the word depression in, or if I put anxiety, or there's other topics that this would be a much, much higher number. So again, this is really emerging as a field. Um, you know, the topics that were included, you know, the relationship between teacher wellness and child outcomes. And I, I'm hoping more studies will come out with that because you want to see that if we can improve teacher wellness and invest in that, that we'll see better student outcomes. Um, you know, burnout, depression, teacher self-efficacy, how to measure this. So the field's definitely getting there, but there's def it, it, compared to other areas of mental health, it's not as advanced. So wellness programs in the workplace. So a lot of the literature to understand what is best, we're really looking at the workplace, the larger business community to see what is going on. And again, as I mentioned, when there are programs, they typically are involving nutrition, weight, smoking, um, fitness. So, and I'm not saying those aren't good, but you also, not everybody needs that. And you know, you know, figuring out like that stress management, about half the programs have that. And as we're talking about everyone being stressed, it's nice to include that. It's also nice to have that health education as well. And sometimes you can come up with strategies that may not be that effective. Part of the company's new fitness program, I presume. I mean, that's one strategy. You can hide everything. And you know, or you get exercise to get your snack. I would have climbed for the pumpkin bread. Um, <laughs> But you know, how do we make sure that we're doing better investments than that? 
one of the things that's really important as we are thinking about wellness, you know, if you're going to do this and as you all are involved in different grants or projects, you need to be able to measure it. You know, at the end of the day, people don't want to hear like, well, I think it worked because I feel like it worked. Melody would not be happy if that was our measurement system. Um, so there are some measures that exist. The CDC Worksite Health Scorecard, employers can assess their evidence-based promotion interventions, and it can help identify gaps in health promotion programs. It can help prioritize high-impact strategies. And most of all, it fits your budget. It's involved, you know, available at no cost. We also have the Professional Quality of Life Scale. Again, no cost. And what I, I like about this is it's measuring compassion fatigue, but also compassion satisfaction. So similar to what Megan was talking about, there's, it isn't as simple as like, well, all compassion is bad. I mean, you, people get a lot out of taking care of others. And there can be, you know, what is that balance of the satisfaction versus um, the fatigue? And that can be given individually or in groups. There is a measure of um, teacher sense of efficacy questionnaire. It's 24 items and it asks like how much they can do in their classrooms related to instructional strategies, classroom management, student engagement. But again, it's around a teacher sense. So if you're looking to have a program, these are some measures that you can use. So it all, you know, often it comes down what you can or can't do comes down to the money. So the economics of wellness. So you ever feel like this is the strategy they're offer offering? Like, wish for good health. If only it could be that simple and there could be a little wishing well and that would solve all your problems. But what we do know, there are studies and you know, part of justifying having a wellness program is to be able to show the economics of it. So Rand suggested that participation in a wellness program over five years equals lower health care costs and decreased health care use. And um, healthcare expenditures are nearly 50% greater for workers who report high levels of stress. So, you know, then you have to go deeper and you get our economists coming in and they're doing all kinds of meta-analyses. Uh, meta so what we do know in the wellness workplace programs, we found that the medical costs fall $3.27 for every dollar spent and absenteeism costs fall two seventy three dollars for every dollar spent. And again, another one found that employee wellness programs, $5.81 to a dollar. Now, this is a leap of faith. It's hard to, you can't always prove that, the, you know, or it may take time to see some of these effects, but knowing the literature and making the argument up front, like this is why we're spending it. And I think probably most powerful for schools is the reduction in absenteeism rates, because that's where you're spending your money on substitutes and it's not good for learning for students. So if you can improve some of this and reduce those rates, potentially that cost savings alone may justify um, some of the program costs. In a, um, economics of wellness in 42 published works up, work site health promotion programs, when there were effective programs, there was a 28% reduction in sick days, 26% reduction in health costs, and a 30% reduction in workman's compensation and disability, disability claims. So these things can be really you know, powerful. And as we know, our teachers are in a stressful position. And you know, they're, if you have these wellness programs, it can reduce their, you know, the costs associated with taking care of the teachers. But when you do have programs, not only can it reduce the cost, but the employees are more satisfied. They're happier, you have improved employee performance, fewer absences, and most of all, improved retention of teachers. You don't, think of how much you invest in your teachers. It, you don't just get a teacher, there's lots of training, there's lots of support, there's lots of guidance along the way. When someone leaves, you have a, a, a staff member who's part of your team you can't just quickly replace them. You may quickly replace them, but it takes a while then to retrain the next person. So in doing this, you know, there are some standards that have been developed. The Alliance for a Healthier Generation published some recommendations with best practices and you know, kind of like PBIS and other programs, you get to get categories of bronze, silver, and gold, and especially with the Olympics going on. Like, 
don't you want these, the, the status of having some of these categories? So for the bronze category, you would have to have health assessments for staff once a year and a program for staff members on physical activity and modeling healthy eating. Notice the word modeling. You don't have to do it. Just model healthy <laughs> eating and physical activity behaviors. But if you want to get the silver, you have to meet the bronze, you promote staff member participation in health promotion programs, and you have programs for staff on healthy eating and weight management and free or low cost. And gold, you meet the silver, and then they take away your, snack, your unhealthy snacks. So you have to have smart snacks in school that meet the school nutrition standards, and you're doing this at your staff meetings, school-sponsored school events, and the staff lounge. Now, we have a school health conference, and it, I have to admit, we, this probably went on more years than I'm willing to admit. We've had the conference for about 14 years, and it was probably only a few years ago that we noticed we are school health with all these school nurses, and we had nutrition talks. We serve the most unhealthy lunch ever, but over time, like, we've improved, but sometimes you're not even noticing that. So you can sit there and have all these standards for youth and what you want to have in your cafeteria, and then you have your staff bringing in sodas and McDonald's and other stuff into the classroom. So just, you know, things to think about, you know, how do you promote that health and wellness with your teachers as well. How many of you have heard of the coordinated school health model? came out from the CDC, it's been around for quite some time, and, but since 87, and I just want to point out that even back then, they've been, you know, there was school site health promotion for staff was one of the components. So that has, all, has been something that they viewed as part of the importance if you want to have coordinated school health. Our directors of health promotion and education have wellness program elements that they've identified and these are some of the things that we've been talking about this morning, like having, you know, you need to have health education, you need to actually have the activities as well. You need to have safe, supportive, social and physical environments. And the worksite program should not be in isolation. It should be part of the school or district structure. So it would be nice if you can create some of these. And you all are so savvy with your apps and, you know, <laughs> My goodness, like just click on this code and everything pops up. There are so many apps out there available around staff wellness, and potentially you can even connect them to some of the technology that you already have. It's also important to connect to your EAP programs. There should be some work site screening program, but just like mental health, if you screen for it, be willing to, what is your next step? To screen for it and say, congratulations, we've identified this problem, let's admire it, is not very helpful. So if you're going to identify something in your students or your staff, make sure you have a plan for what can happen next. And then make sure there's education and resources. And just because we're older than the students doesn't mean we know everything about what we should and shouldn't do. There's a lot of myths about nutrition, about health. I mean, that we can all still continue to learn. And it also changes. I mean, I'm always amazed, like, how did, that, how did the food pyramid change? You know, like, things are, the recommendations of what you should and shouldn't have, if you pay attention to that, that changes over time. Updating that information with state-of-the-art information is important. And again, evaluation and an improvement process. How do we document that this is working and having the impact that we want it to have? So what we know is only 25% of schools offer stress management education to staff. And when there is education, it often isn't evidence-based. And there, you know, there isn't much research you know, when it is provided, what are the impacts. So again, this, there's a lot of room for growth for this. But there, you know, there's some optimism. There was a program that was conducted in Nevada. And they, the independent variable was whether they participated in a wellness program or not. And for their school staff, what they found, they, they looked at, you know, the covariates were baseline and health claims, absenteeism, age, gender, job classification, and years in the school districts. And while they didn't find significant differences in health care costs, what they did find, again, is that differences in absenteeism, that participants had an average of three fewer missed days which equals a saving of $15.60 for every dollar spent. So just fewer absences could help justify this again. Um, mindfulness, I believe that was part of your training the other day. 
it's not only for your students, it's really good for your teachers as well. There are some studies um, included in SAMHSA's evidence-based program registry. While at first they were thinking of it more for chronic pain, it actually has been found to be quite helpful with um, and has been adapted for teachers by two different research groups. So one group, now again, this is an investment. Look at the time that this takes, eight weeks, two and a half hours per week, one day long immersion. I know how valuable professional development time is. Figuring out how do you integrate this or what programs can you do that are realistic. You don't want to make it that to do this program you have to stay an extra two and a half hours would not be popular. <laughs> but. Um, what we do know is, you know, another is that when they were doing this program, like this one, eight weeks, two hours per week, there was improvement in self-regulation, self-compassion, mindfulness, and sleep quality. So it does help teachers. There are two larger uh, interventions that are being used, the Cultivating Awareness and Resilience in Education, the CARE program, four-day long sessions over four to five weeks. They focus on three main content areas, emotion, skill instruction, mindfulness, stress reduction, caring and, caring and listening practices. And again, as teachers are learning this, not only can they learn it for themselves, but they also can bring it to the classroom. And you know what they found with this randomized control um, trial is improvements in well-being, teacher efficacy, burnout, mindfulness, and there's another program, See so You Have Care, and their competing program is CALM, Community Approach to Learning Mindfully, and that's a daily school-based intervention to promote, improve social-emotional competencies, stress management, well-being, teaching, health, and the interview, intervention included yoga and mindfulness four days a week for 16 weeks. So again, you know, this, is, this is best practice, but figuring out what works for a given community and how much time can you invest. But when you do this, and I mean, these are powerful results where you've changed your level of cortisol. Like that's impressive. Beyond, you know, beyond just mindfulness and emotional functioning, you're actually changing, you know, bodily measures. So what we do know is you know you can have the more sophisticated programs, but even in like the less intensive programs, there's a program in Dallas, a 10-week health promotion program, to really just focused on exercise and physical fitness. And by doing this as a community, what they found is 44% of teachers changed their overall lifestyle, 68% changed their diet, 26% who did not exercise began vigorous programs, 18% quit smoking, and there was, again, fewer days of absenteeism. Now, this isn't a long-term follow-up. I don't know how they're doing now, but the idea that you can affect change, and especially if you're developing supports for people to continue those, um, the, the gains that they've made can be quite powerful. And so just in summary, we know that school employee wellness programs can make a difference, and, but you have to focus not just on the physical, but on nutrition, stress management, other components. And if you can do this and figure out what works best for your system, there's opportunities to increase teacher morale, help improve you know, how to handle job stress, reduce absenteeism, improved overall well-being. And, you know, for our administrators and our budget people, you can ultimately justify it by being able to save money. So, you know, for those of you who just love exercising as much as me, you know, what doesn't kill you can make you stronger. And, you know, you have to invest to be able to make this happen. And for someone who you know, has fun with dieting here, don't forget you are what you eat. I need to eat a skinny person. So, if only were that easy. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Right near you. You're really excited. <laughs> Hi. I'm not sure if that's working. Uh, I don't think. I'll turn it on. I don't have control of it. Oh, okay. Hello? I hear you. But. <laughs> like this into our district and we have. However, 
if I, and I can scream for stress with all right. their employees and all that, but if I continue to be the source of their stress. Right, now if they're, you know, so I that is the I elephant in the room, my is, goodness, right? yes. So I can say, okay, here's your stress, but on the night, on the same, we could be a culture of avoidance, of shame, right. of focusing on test scores. So I wonder where in your research, um, do you, have you looked at the impact of leadership on wellness and those factors or qualities as, as for us as school administrators? I don't think it's been as direct research evaluating that, but I certainly know that program success of any program in a school needs the administrator buy-in. So there's certainly research that documents when you have the administrator support, you definitely, the programs will do better. But I think that's a great point that you're bringing up to and a, a factor that needs to be taken into consideration. It, it reminds me of the work we do with students where if you have 15 students coming from the same classroom, all with the same type of problem, eventually you have to ask yourself a question, maybe my time would be better spent. So like in some ways, if you did a, you know, before you implement a program, if you did some level of a needs assessment in your school before implementing and you found out that all the stress seemed to be pointing at some administrative concerns or things like that to be able to address those as well. But I do think that's an area that it, there isn't much in the research, but it's a great, you know, it's a great question. And um, it, you, you, it's like putting a Band-Aid on and not right. really right. fixing right. the issue at hand. But I, my guess is uh, because you're asking the question, it wouldn't be happening in your That's school. Right. Says, well, yeah. As a, right, as yeah. a former counselor, too, it helps to be right. Involved. And oftentimes, you, we often say, let's bring in these programs, bring in these programs, and not really addressing right. the, and then, the leadership of this. School. And the question is, is like, how do you bring in the programs yeah. and keep them sustained? And you know, not just like, okay, so for you know, wellness, we're gonna have this 10-week program, then for the next five years, you're on your own. Right. But you right. know, like, right. how do you keep it going? Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Um, I wondered if um, you might be able to point some of us in directions of models that have been successful in schools because I, um, we have a lot of uh, administrative buy-in and support for a lot of initiatives for wellness in our school district, mm -hmm. but I think it's just a conflict of interest, I think, for administrators right. to be in the role of being the go-to person mm -hmm. for teachers that they evaluate, and I think that prevents a lot of um, teachers from stepping forward and sharing some of the more deeper concerns that they have from an emotional standpoint in their classrooms and their experience as being a teacher. Um, so then, so I'm, I'm a school-based mental health clinician, so then I end up getting sort of my colleagues coming to me and, and my other counseling colleagues, and we have our own level of being saturated with, right. with our, our own you know, job demands right. and caseloads and such. So I wonder, you know, so I, I sort of envision something like that having to be operated by more independent sort of folks that are able to devote the time yeah, I, and energy to that? So. My, you know, I, I don't think the literature has spoken <coughs> directly to it, but I would, you're right, if you know, stress management is managed by your school principal and you come in and you say, tell me your stress and what emotional challenges are you having, it might be crickets. You might not yeah. get many responses, but in terms of programs that are working, I, you know, I just went to a presentation for one of the counties in Maryland, Howard County, that has a whole comprehensive wellness program, including the use of apps, and I can send some information and um, look to some models that are working. And again, like, you know, there are some of those larger research studies that I touched on at the end, but figure, you know, that may not be realistic for many programs, but I think to know, like, what is it that you're, you know, what are, what's your staff most interested? Is it the nutrition? Is it the stress management? And I mean, even to have surveys where you're trying to, like, those could be anonymous, and someone could monitor those and keep track of, you know, of these 10 components. We, you know, while it would be ideal to have all 10 components, which ones should we prioritize? Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for like, oh.
I just have a comment. Um, a colleague of mine for the Endowment for Health just finished a workforce retention report for um, a study of people who work in community mental health. Mm -hmm. And there are some really good information in there. It's on the Endowment for Health's well website. It was an anonymous survey of community mental health workers and uh, you know, discussed turnover and factors that help them stay in their jobs, but also factors that force them to leave or, or they're thinking about leaving. So, Is uh, that something, Mary, that we can put yeah, up? Can go ahead and put that on oh, great. We'll get that on there today. Yeah, it's a great resource. Thank you, Joanne.